And we are now recording. Let me go through a couple of announcements, sort of a good news, bad news situation. Um, the good news is next week is Thanksgiving week. The bad news is we don't have any classes next week. Sorry about that. Get over it. Okay. Uh, normally, you would think we'd have classes Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but that's when the Alabama Community College Association has their annual meetings. And since a fair number of people will be attending that, they uh, give students the time off. The rest of us who are not attending will be doing professional development here on campus. Actually, not this campus, but the Birmingham campus. So uh, I will not be, well, let me, we are recording, but let me get the screen set up. Okay. Uh, so I will be on campus as most people will be. You know, the meetings are down in Montgomery, and a lot of people are choosing not to go all that way down there, but quite a few people are. Uh, Danielle is here. Now the top part of the alphabet is taking over good attendance, and the bottom part, the middle. Okay, where are they? Okay. I'm sorry? Uh, if we finish 2.6 today, it'll be Thursday. More likely it's going to be the Tuesday we get back. Okay. Okay. Now, um, like, like I was saying, a, a few people will be at the meetings. A lot of us will not be there, but we will be at professional meetings on the Birmingham campus. So Monday and Tuesday of next week, I will not be in my office here. I will be there. Now, if you have business to do with the college, all the offices will be open, okay? Um, Andrea? Evan, you got it, sorry. I know you're in here, I just can't find you. There you are, okay. All right. Um, so, all the offices will be open. They won't be fully staffed, but someone will be in all the offices, so if you have any business to do with the college, Monday and Tuesday, you can get that taken care of. If you need to speak with an advisor or an instructor, that's going to be a little harder to find on Monday and Tuesday because we'll be in professional meetings uh, just about all day those two days. Okay. Wednesday, however, we're back in our offices. So I'll be back on the Bethmer campus uh, and other folks will be in their offices. Except... That is a day that's pretty popular for people to take a personal day because Thanksgiving the next day, if they're getting ready for um, a family coming in or something like that, they may not be uh, there. So my suggestion or advice to you would be if you are wanting to speak with an instructor or possibly even an administrator or staff person next week, check with them this week and make sure if they're going to be on campus, when they're going to be on campus, which campus they're going to be on, and um, and that type of thing, because there's no guarantee. I will be here at least Wednesday morning. Now, the reason I say that, quite often, they don't always do it, it's certainly not guaranteed, but usually the day before a big holiday like this, uh, for the few people who are here, they'll say, y'all can take off at blah, blah time. I've heard that it could be as early as 12. I've heard that uh, last year it seems like it was around 2. There's no guarantee they're going to do it. Uh, but if uh, there is a chance, and the fact that people may be taking personal leave for even a couple hours or something like that, that could be the case too. So if you're planning to see someone next week, don't wait until Wednesday afternoon. Okay? There's a real good chance, even if they were here most of the week, next week, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, they probably will get pretty sparse here Wednesday afternoon. So if you've got business to do at the college, take care of it Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday morning-ish, okay? Early afternoon, we'll probably still have quite a few people around, but it gets a lot sparser as we go later in the day. Okay, there's that. Also, now my office hours on Friday this week. 
I've got to get my uh, take care of the situation with my car, and I was going to do it after 11:45 on Friday. My wife suggests I better probably should do it early because otherwise I might be in line forever. Okay, so I uh, I'll probably I'm gonna check with my boss, make sure it's okay. I'll probably go to the courthouse before eight o'clock and be there when they open to get doors. Hopefully there won't be a huge line then. Get it taken care of. Then I'll head to campus. So I'm guessing I I'm hoping I'll be on campus at least by ten and even earlier than that. But I'll be there then for the next four hours after that, ten till two or nine thirty to one thirty, something like that. So uh, it won't be my normal office hours on Friday, I don't think. Hopefully I'll know by uh, Thursday when we meet again, I'll let you know when my office hours on Friday will be. All right. Now, for this class, since a few of you have come in since I started this, there were some questions. We're starting 2.6 today. If we finish 2.6 today, the test for 2.6 will be Thursday. If we don't, it will be Midi two, right? Okay. Uh, no. uh, we will be. Uh, it will be Tuesday when we get back. Okay. All right. Any questions before we get started today? I'm sorry, I'll put it back. Okay. There we go. Okay, good deal. Anyone else come in since the code roll? All right, we're still, in fact, we're finishing chapter two, polynomial and rational functions. Up till now, we've been dealing almost strictly with polynomial functions. This section 2.6 is where we deal with rational functions. What do we mean by rational functions? That means they think well. And what do you think rational functions mean? What's the first five letters? Ratio. What's the ratio? One such ratio would be one half, two thirds, anything that's division. Comparison of two numbers in a division sense. That's what we mean by ratios. So, if that's for numbers, functions would be the ratio of any two polynomial functions. Not just any old functions, but polynomial functions that would form what we call a rational function. Okay, so our objectives here will be find the domains of rational functions. With polynomial functions, what was our domain? All real numbers, unless you had some sort of restricted domain for the um, purpose of the problem or you know, something like that, like you were only looking at five years or something like that, so then you would only limit it to those five years. Or if you're dealing with a physical constant that was never negative or couldn't be zero, yeah, you would restrict those. But generally with polynomial functions, unless there's some sort of restriction like that, the domains are all real numbers. Rational functions, why would we worry now with rational functions? They're ratios of polynomials. So what would be the issue here? The denominator. And why is that an issue? What can denominators never be? Zero. So now we have to make sure that not only, yeah, that polynomial denominator has no, uh, is good for all real numbers, but if that result is zero, then you limit your domain on the rational function. Now, we also find vertical and horizontal asymptotes of the graphs of rational functions. Basically, what we're just talking about, where your denominator would be zero, that's going to be a vertical asymptote. So those two tie together really closely. Horizontal asymptotes are a little different there. We'll get into that but it's tied to something we've already done. So we'll get there. We'll sketch graphs, since we're going to do the vertical asymptotes, the horizontal asymptotes. We already know how to find the zeros. We'll find, know how to find the intercepts. We'll do all that kind of stuff. 
So we'll sketch the graphs of rational functions. Then we'll sketch the graphs of rational functions that have slant asymptotes. No, we won't. Okay? We're going to skip that part. Okay? And we'll use rational functions to model and solve some real life problems. Yes, we'll do that part. So, that was part of the introduction. This whole slide of introduction. A rational function is a quotient or a ratio of polynomial functions. Can be written in the form f of x, this is the rational function, f of x is equal to n of x over d of x. Why would they choose n and d? Numerator and denominator, exactly. Polynomial functions, not always, but quite often are given capital letters. So this is a Polynomial function in the numerator, polynomial function in the denominator. N of x, d of x are polynomials. D of x is not the zero polynomial. Technically, we usually say that's not a polynomial anyway, but it's just not the zero polynomial. It's not just zero, the number zero. Can't have that. Okay? Uh, later, we'll worry about having values of zero, but it just can't be the zero polynomial. In general, the domain of a rational function, x, includes all real numbers except for those x values that make that denominator zero. So there's where we focus on domain. Who cares about the numerator? Anything can be in the numerator. It's just the places in the denominator that values of x that would make, or whatever your variable is, make that denominator zero. You have to exclude those from the domain of the whole rational function. Much of the discussion of rational functions will focus on their graphical behavior near those x values excluded from the domain. And generally, here's what's going to happen. Generally, if you've got something excluded from the domain, as x approaches that from the left, usually it's going to go to positive infinity or negative infinity. As x approaches it from the right, usually it's going to positive infinity or negative infinity. That's going to be the usual behavior there. There will be a few fairly rare examples where a value may be excluded from the domain, but it doesn't give you a, a vertical asymptote. And that would be when there's a hole in the graph. Okay, now that's a little bizarre, but it can happen. Okay, sort of special case. All right, here's example one. Find the domain of f of x equal 1 over x. What you reckon that domain would be? What you reckon the domain, the accepted values? Let's see, Sydney, right? All right. Second, x cannot equal zero. Exactly. All other real numbers, perfectly fine but not x equals zero. So you cannot have zero in the denominator. Okay? So, what's going to happen as x gets close to zero, either from the left or from the right, what happens to the function f? What's the behavior near that excluded x value? Only x value excluded x equals zero. Well, let's try a few. Give me something close to zero. One, okay? When f of x, when x is equal to 1, what's f of x? 1. Okay, get a little closer to 0. Second? 0. 0.1. Okay, 1 tenth. Okay, 1 over 1 tenth would be 1 divided by 1 over 10. Second? 10. It would be 10. So you get a little closer to zero, you go from one to ten. Want to go even closer? Point zero one, one hundred. What would your f of x be then? One hundred, okay? What do you reckon is happening to that function as x is closer and closer to zero from the right? Yes, yeah, going, yeah, it, well actually the value is getting huge, okay? One, Ten, a hundred, a thousand, million, ten million, it's going to infinity. All right. Yeah, Sean, all right. Okay. Now, 
Let's approach zero from the left hand side. So give me a value for x approaching zero from the left. Negative one. What would uh, f be when x is negative one? Okay? Negative one. How about negative one tenth? Negative ten. Negative one hundred. Negative one hundred. Okay? So the function is approaching negative infinity. It's x that's closer to zero than from the left, then the function is going closer and closer. I mean, it's just getting extraordinarily large negative, which is, we say, approaching negative infinity. So there is no such number as infinity. Because of the denominator of zero when x equals zero, the domain of f is all real numbers except x equals zero. Okay? And here's their approach to this, it determines the behavior of x near the excluded value, f of x, the left and right of zero, indicated in the following table. Uh, all right, f is here. Okay. So, <coughs> they're starting on the negative side, if x is negative 1, f of x is negative 1, you already did that f of x is negative one half, f, I mean x equal negative one half, f of x is negative two, negative one tenth, negative ten, you did that one, negative one hundred, one hundred, negative one hundred, you did that one, negative a thousand, <coughs> negative a thousand, I mentioned that one, so sure enough, as x gets closer and closer and closer to zero, this is going out of control negative, in other words, going to negative infinity. As x is approaching zero from the right hand side, and it's 1, f of x is 1, 1 half is 2, 1 tenth is 10, 100 is 100, 1,000 is 1,000, as x gets closer and closer to 0 from the right, going to positive infinity. You reckon this is a continuous function? No. no. <laughs> Nowhere close. From the left, it's going this way, from the right, it's this way, and it has no value at 0, so it can't be continuous. Okay? Cannot be continuous. So therefore, uh, it's not like a polynomial function there. Even though it's a ratio of two polynomial functions, because of that denominator, uh, has a, a place where it could be zero, that then wipes out the possibility of this being a continuous function. Okay? So, note that as x approaches zero from the left, f of x decreases without bound. As x approaches 0 from the right, f increases without bound. Okay? Now, there's a little shorthand that we use for this. Here's a graph of the function. As when x is 1, f of x is 1. It doesn't look like they graphed that quite right, does it? You scoot it up a little bit. When it's 1 half, it's 2. When it's 1 tenth, it's 10. And it's 100, it's 100, it's going to positive infinity there. As x is approaching negative 1, again, that doesn't look like we moved this down far enough, um, that would be negative 1, negative 1 half would be negative 2, negative uh, tenth would be negative 10, negative 100, way, way down there. So that's where it's going here. Let's go to the large value. As x is going to 2, this would be a half. 3 would be 1 third, 4 would be 1 fourth, 10 would be 1 tenth, 100 would be 1 hundred, 1,000 would be 1 thousandth, getting closer and closer to 0. As x gets large, that's going closer and closer to 0. As x is getting small, you're approaching 0 again. And when x is very, very negative, negative 2 is 1, negative 1 half, negative 1 Negative 10 would be negative 1 tenth, negative 100, negative 100, negative 1,000, you know, so it's getting closer and closer to zero there. By the way, that's going to be our horizontal asymptote. x is a wide equal to zero. But we're not there yet. Okay. So that's how the graph looks. Okay. What's the x-intercept of that graph? Doesn't have it. How about y-intercept? does not have any. X can't be zero, so that it has no y-intercept. And because 
And it, frankly, because the numerator is not zero and can never be zero, it can't have a, an, an x intercept either. Okay? So the y value can't be zero. All right, I've already mentioned them. Here we're going to start talking about vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Okay? In example one, we saw that behavior there. And here's, remember when we were doing end behavior of polynomial functions, we had this little thing. I like to start with the x as x is approaching something, y is approaching, or f of x is going something, x is going somewhere else. Yes. So here we have the same kind of pattern here, but we do this for our disallowed values. In other words, the places where the naked denominator is zero, you let x approach that from the left. What is f of x doing? Going to negative infinity. As x approaches that zero from the right, f of x is going to positive infinity. So here we have the same type setup as we had for n behavior. Now, with n behavior, every blank had an infinity in it, remember? They were either plus or minus. You had to decide that, okay? Here, they're not. The x's are going to be approaching whatever those disallowed values are. The places that you make the denominator zero, you're approaching from the left and from the right. And you could have several of those. So you might have several of these uh, sort of decision lines to do. Okay. That line x equals zero is a vertical asymptote because the f is approaching negative infinity on one side, positive infinity on the other. It can never touch or cross that vertical asymptote. The value of the denominator is zero. So, and since it's approaching the infinity, if you come one way or the other, then that's a vertical asymptote. Okay? Now, I've already mentioned y is equal to zero happens to be the horizontal asymptote. They haven't told us why yet, you can just see it in the graph. The, and frankly here, this is your end behavior. What happens when x is very large negatively or very large positively? With polynomial functions, you knew it was going to an infinity, right? With uh, rational functions, it may be going to an infinity, it may be going to some number. In this case, it's going to zero. Why is it going to zero? That's your horizontal asymptote here. Some rational functions will not have the horizontal asymptote, but it's that they're going to infinity. We'll talk about that very soon. Okay? Any questions so far? All right. Now, from the figure you just had, this figure here, Okay, from that figure, you can see that the graph of f of x also has a horizontal asymptote. In this case, it was the line y is equal to zero. The behavior of f near y is equal to zero is denoted this way. So your vertical asymptotes, you have these lines, and the horizontal asymptotes, you have these lines. Horizontal asymptotes, far closer to what we had for the end behavior. Because they all start, the x is either going to a negative infinity or a positive infinity. You can fill those blanks in right off the top. One's going to negative, one's going to positive. Okay? And then you determine where the f is going as x goes toward both of those places. That may be going to an infinity, positive or negative. Okay? Could be going to zero. Could be going to some other number. But generally what it's going to here is going to be generally the same as it's going the other direction. Don't want to say that always, but generally that's the same. In this case, f of x approaches zero as x decreases without bound, and f of x approaches zero again if uh, x increases without bound. Now you don't need to do this, but you could have. You could have said on this side, remember, down there, up there, you notice it's approaching zero from the opposite directions. So you could say, the book doesn't require, I don't require, you could say f of x is approaching zero from the left, so you put a little minus sign up, up here, as x is going to negative infinity, f of x is approaching zero from the upper side, as x is going to positive infinity. So you could put those in, but you don't need to. Just one to zero. Okay. 
Now, I sort of slid it in. I don't know if you picked up on it. A function can never touch nor cross a vertical asymptote. It can cross or touch a horizontal asymptote. Because your horizontal asymptote is the end behavior. What's going on in here, it can cross that as much as it wants. It can never cross a vertical asymptote, but it can cross a horizontal asymptote. And quite often does. We'll see examples of that. And there's sometimes it doesn't, but that's fine too. So here's your rules for vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Definitions. The line x equal a, that's a vertical line, is a vertical asymptote of the graph when f of x approaches infinity or negative infinity. Either one of these as x approaches a. If either of those happens, that's a vertical asymptote. That's either from the right or from the left. Approaching a from the left or from the right, if it's going to an infinity, that's a vertical asymptote. Like I said, we will have a few examples where that's not going to be the case. It may not be defined at A, but it won't go to infinity. Okay? Now, the line Y is equal to B, that's a horizontal line. Y is equal to B is a horizontal asymptote of the graph when F of X approaches B and X approaches uh, infinity either from the right or from the left. You usually only have one horizontal asymptote, if you have one. You may not have one, but if you do have one, you only have one, okay? You can have several vertical asymptotes. How many zeros you have in your denominator, okay? Uh, you don't have to figure that out, okay? If this is where x is going positive or negative infinity, f of x equals b is going to be the same both ways. You don't always have horizontal asymptotes. Eventually, as x approaches either positive infinity or negative infinity, the distance between the horizontal asymptotes and the points on the graph must be approaching zero. Getting closer and closer and closer, generally not touching. However, now we won't do anything like this. You could have a function that does this. Okay, it starts wavering here, but then the larger and larger x's the wiggle, it goes up and down, up and down, but it's getting closer and closer to zero. And it's still a horizontal asymptote. We won't see any like that, but it could. So a function can touch or cross a horizontal asymptote, but it's where it approaches as x gets larger and larger, positive or negative. I want to say and negative. Okay. So here are some examples of asymptotes. Okay. What would be your vertical asymptote? Well, I always show everything. I'll just show you everything. All right. Since they're showing everything, then I'm going to go on and, and tell you how we got it. What is it that determines a vertical asymptote? Said it a few times. Well, okay. Uh, it's where your second. Yes, it's any time the denominator is equal to zero, that's where you have the potential vertical asymptote. That's exactly right. So you say that denominator cannot equal zero, x plus one cannot equal zero. This is how I like to do it. The book doesn't do it this way, but this to me makes sense. Okay? You know denominators cannot be zero, right? So you take this thing right here and say x plus 1 cannot equal 0. You know a denominator can't be 0, right? Solve that inequality. Subtract 1 from both sides, and what does that give you? x cannot equal negative 1. And there's your vertical asymptote. x cannot equal negative 1. Draw that dotted line there. Make it a red line. No, you don't need to. Say, don't touch it. Don't go close to you. You can get close, but you can't touch it. Okay? There's your vertical asymptote. Now, that's how you find the vertical asymptote. Now, I'm jumping a little bit ahead. Uh, let me... I'll hold off for a moment in, about the horizontal. Ah, let's do it. Okay. Horizontal asymptote. Here's your hint. Okay. Where did we look for end behavior in polynomial functions? Where did we look? The what? 
Yeah, we look left and right. Okay, yeah, I got it. Okay. Yeah. But where in the polynomial function did we look? What was the thing that determined what happened in the middle? Okay, you're doing a rational zeros test. The second thing you said, the leading term test, remember? That's where you look. That determined your end behavior. Up and down, wherever, you know? Is that leading term determined that? Well, in a rational function, you look at the ratio of the leading terms. 2x over x, what's that ratio? 2. And guess what your horizontal asymptote is? y is equal to 2. There it is. That's where it's going in the long run uh, when x goes very negative or when x goes very positive. Okay? Now, we need a few more points, don't we, to do our graph. Okay? What's a really easy one to do? What zero? X equals zero. That will be your Your y-intercept, exactly. x equals 0 being y-intercept. x equals 0, what do you get? Y. So your y-intercept, right there, 0, 1. There it is. Okay, you got another point. Now, if you got the y-intercept there, how do you get the x-intercept? You do y is equal to 0, f of x equals 0, y f of x equals 0. So how can this be 0? It's the numerator zero. Who cares what the denominator is? If that numerator zero, y is zero, right? So if that's equal to zero, two x plus one is equal to zero. What does that give you? That would give you, and that's equal to, x is equal to negative one half. Okay. Subtract one from both sides, divide by two. And look here. There's your x in itself right there. Negative one half zero. Y is zero. So, you have these two. Now, once you have these two points, it's real easy. This has to be approaching your vertical asymptotes from this side, horizontal asymptotes from that side. So you know exactly how to plot that without seeing any other points. Okay. Question is, you don't know how to do the upper part, well, the, the, the part on the other side. So what would I do? Second. Uh, if you knew that was going to happen, What's you see it will, but if you're drawing this and you didn't see what it was, I do a test point. Pick a value. You got values right of your vertical asymptote. Pick values to the left of it, like negative 2. Plug it in, plug it in. What would that give you? Plus. Okay, negative 3 over. Negative 1. What's negative 3 over negative 1? Positive 3. So there you are up here at 3. Right there. Okay? So you know exactly where this is going. As you get closer to negative 1, it's going to rise uh, indefinitely. As you get closer to, as you get larger, larger and larger negative values, it's going to approach the horizontal. So all you need is one point in there, and you generally know where it's going. All right, let's look at f x 4 over x squared. What do you want to look for first? Uh, e long from the horizontal asymptote. How do you get it? Ratio of the leading term. Oh, this is your end behavior. Think leading term. Ratio of leading term. What happens to that if x is very large, either positive or negative? Give me a large number. 20? Is that what you said? Okay, 20 squared is? 400. So 4 over 400 is? 1 over 100. That's going to be really close to 0, right? Ah, looks like we may have it. Y looks like it's going to be 0. That's going to be your horizontal estimate. Anytime you have a very large number in the denominator and a fixed number in top, that's what it's going to be. If x is very large, positive, or negative, it's going to be zero. Okay, so you got your horizontal asymptote. Why did you not do your vertical? 
Where do you look for your vertical asphalt? Denominator. And what your denominator can't be for your vertical asphalt? Zero. X squared minus Y plus one cannot equal zero. Duh, it can't be zero. No matter what real number X you put in there, even zero, zero squared is zero plus one is positive. Any other, negative 50. That would be negative 50 squared is 2500. Positive, plus one, 25 over one. Not zero, okay? You cannot make that denominator zero in the real number system, all right? So therefore, there is no vertical axis. Because that denominator can never be zero. Okay? How about x-intercept? That would be when? What's your what? X-intercept. This. Courtney, right? Yeah. All right, good deal. All right, good deal. Good morning. Okay. How do we find the x intercept? Y is equal to zero. What's your y? Say again? What's the y? But in function talk, function speech, what is y always? F of x. So you set this equal to zero. If this is equal to zero, what better be zero over here? The numerator. Doesn't matter what the denominator is, for this to be zero, the numerator to be zero. It's forever zero. Never. So therefore, there is no horizontal intercept. There is, I mean, horizontal uh, intercept, x-intercept. Can't have it, because four is not equal to zero. How about vertical asymptote? How do we get that? I'm sorry. Yeah, but y-intercept. Y I keep saying the wrong word. Y intercept. How do we get Y intercept? Set X equals zero. X equals zero here, what you get? Four over one is four. There it is, right there. Okay? Now, you've got your horizontal asymptote, no vertical asymptote, no, no uh, X intercept. You got your Y intercept. You could pick another couple of, uh, uh, you don't really need your test point because you know the greater this goes, the closer it's getting to zero, because you know your horizontal asymptote. Guess what? It's got to be going to zero, too. You just don't know the shape of it, okay? It's got to be something like this. Pick a point here, put a minus one and a plus one in, you'll get a bunch of those cases that be one with one is two, four to two, two to three, plus two, plus two minus two. Yeah, that gives me a good enough idea of going to that. Okay. Here's another one. F of x is equal to 2 over x minus 1 squared. What do you want to investigate first? Say again? Factor the denominator, what does that give you? Yes. So why do you want to factor that? It was the same, but yeah. Well, what are you want looking for here? Okay. So what happens with a root? If your denominator, a root is where that polynomial is equal to zero. What happens if your denominator is zero? Can't be zero. So what's your graph going to be there? A vertical asymptote, exactly. So when x equal 1, that makes that your vertical asymptote. x equal 1 or x equal 1. Double root there. So yeah, there is your dotted line. It can never touch it. It can never cross it. Okay? Vertical asymptote. Okay? Now, let's do our other thing. Four things we're investigating. Two asymptotes, two intercepts. Okay? You got your vertical asymptote. What's your next one? Horizontal. How do you get the horizontal asymptote? 
Say again? Yeah, leading terms over each other. Leading term here is 2, and here if you square that, that would be x squared. And 2 over x squared is, as x is very, very, remember your horizontal asymptote is your in behavior. So you look at leading terms, and you x goes very large negative or very large positive. And 2 over x squared is going to 0. Absolutely. So horizontal asymptote, y is equal to 0. Remember this. Our vertical asymptote, x equals something. Horizontal asymptote, y is equals something. Okay? Next. We've got two asymptotes. Now we're looking for two. Y'all on football. <laughs> Step in front of the receiver and intercept. Okay, good. Okay. The intercept. Okay. All right. Y intercept. What's well, going to be about three of the Y intercept? X equals zero. If I say X equals zero, what do we have? That's the only one. Which one? One. One. Is two. So our vertical, I mean the Y intercept, zero two. Next one. We already did that. X intercept. What's going to be true there? Y is equal to zero. Is that what you said? Yeah. So okay. it's what you should have said. Okay. <laughs> so, what is your Y? What is your Y? F of X. So for F of X to be zero, what else would have to be zero? The numerator. That's the only way for this to be zero is the numerator has to be zero, right? Is two ever zero? No. So it has no x intercept. And we saw that. That's your horizontal asymptote. It approaches it. In this tells you it never crosses it. Never touches it. Otherwise you'd have a, a uh, x intercept. It doesn't have one, so it's approaching it, but not getting it. So you see how that works? You have enough information just looking at that function form to do intercepts, x and y, asymptotes, vertical and horizontal. Just you have to find the okay. Okay. Yeah. The horizontal asymptote is where the function is going in behavior. And what was that in behavior? Look at leading terms. Leading terms. Remember I said that. So you do your two or the if you expanded this out, x squared minus 2, x plus 1, the leading terms would be 2 over x squared. Let x be very large, positive, or negative, so that <coughs> thing going to 0. So that's your vertical axis, your horizontal axis. Okay? Okay. Okay, if that was a minus one, no, it wouldn't change your, your horizontal asymptote at all. Okay. Okay, because it's the ratio of leading terms. Good question. Excellent question. What that would change would be your, uh, if this up here, was, that was a minus, okay, then your zero would be positive one half over here. Okay? And uh, that would be where it costs the x axis down. Good question. All right, any others? All right, that was way more than they wanted to do on this slide, but I thought since they gave you all the answers, let's see why, how they got those answers, okay? So, let's go back to our good old f of x equals 1 over x, and this figure, they've shown it like three times now. Uh, and this one happens to be what we call a hyperbola, okay? Let me just give you a few of the shapes that we deal with. One shape is a circle, okay, all equal distance from some point. A, an ellipse would be like this, it's like almost like a football, or a, if you stretch the circle in one to, on one axis, that would be an ellipse. Parabola, we already know, that goes like this. A parabola is a two-limb figure uh, going away from each other. Sometimes these are on, you know, 
symmetric about an axis, other times they're symmetric about the origin. That's a hyperbola. Okay? Now, the other one that we had that was a hyperbola, let's see, is this one. See, that's a hyperbola. Now, it's not symmetric about the origin, it's symmetric about that point right there. The point negative 1, 2, and it's symmetric there. Okay. Those are hyperbolas. This is not a parabola, okay? It may look sort of like one, but it's not. That's not quite a hyperbola either because it's not opposite each other. Okay? Close to being what we call a hyperbola, but not quite. Okay. So those two are hyperbolas. Seems like to me it should be hyperbole, but I don't know what they call hyperbolas. So, let's go back over what we were just talking about. Vertical and horizontal asymptotes of rational function. Rational function, again, is give me the definition of rational function. Ratio of 2 polynomial functions, exactly. The numerator function and the denominator function. Both of those are polynomial. Remember how polynomials look? They have some co leading coefficient here, times x to the n. So this sub n just says, this is the coefficient going with that power of n. And a sub n minus 1 goes with x sub n minus 1. This is the actual working part of the problem, the, the exponent. The subscripts here just identify this is the coefficient that goes with that x. Okay. So you count down until you finally get the a sub 2, x squared, from say 1, x, from say 0, there's no there. And the denominator is some other. It may be different powers, the same powers, doesn't matter. Uh, but let's have an m's, x to the m, so this would be sub m. b sub m minus 1, x sub m minus 1. Okay, you count on down until you get b sub 2, x squared, from b sub 1, x, from b sub 0, there's no value, no uh, variable. Okay? Now, here's the key, folks. This numerator, that denominator, must have no common factors. In other words, if you factor that numerator and factor the denominator, you wind up with common factors to get rid of. Okay? Okay. Except you can't just get rid of. Give me a possible common factor. Just make up something that could be a factor. I'm into both of them. Uh, as a polynomial. Yeah. Just How about x minus 2? Right? If you factor this, you have x minus 2 up here and x minus 2 down here, then those are common factors. Okay. Now, the book isn't going into this, I'll just tell you. Because x minus 2 is in that denominator, x can't equal 2. Okay, but you can factor those out so you don't have a vertical asymptote there. That's where you have a polar graph at x equals 2. If you go to draw your graph at x equals 2, wherever the graph is, put a hole in it right there, above 2. Okay, it's down here below 2. Wherever, it can't have that value at x equals 2. So that's why I said the zero in the denominator will not always produce a vertical asymptote. Most of the time it will. But if it's a common factor between the numerator and that, it produces all of that. We're not going to do any of those, I don't think. So, if they don't have any common factors, then the graph of L has vertical asymptotes every zero here. If that was a, give me a value for M. Two, okay. That means you could have up to two zeros in that denominator, right? If M was Seven, you could have seven zeros. You may not have seven, but you could have up to seven, remember? As maximum of the zero. So every one of those zeros you have in the denominator, vertical asymptotes right there. Okay. So the graph of L has vertical asymptotes at every zero in that denominator. Who cares about the numerator? Okay. The graph of L has one or no horizontal asymptotes. Uh, determined by comparing the degrees of N and B. Well, they focus on degrees, I focus on leading terms, ratio of the leading terms. That's all you look at. Now, 
Give me a value for n. Second? Two. Okay, how about for m? Second? Any value will do. Three? Okay. So then if you had, who, who cares about a and b or not anything right now, but if n is equal to two and m is equal to three, what's the ratio of those? Well, x squared over x cubed, right? So what's the ratio of that? x cubed over x squared over x cubed. One over x, because you have a greater number down here, one over x. Is that two, three large positive or negative? That's going to do. So then you'll have a uh, horizontal asymptote with x equal to it. I mean y is equal to it. Horizontal asymptote for y equal to it. Okay, give me another value for n and m. Second? Okay, 7 in the numerator, 3 in the denominator. What's the ratio of that? X to the fourth. You think as, as X goes to positive and negative infinity, what's that going to go? Way big. So then you look at right those, uh, you, you look at your signs there. Just like you did for polynomial signs. Not going to have a horizontal asymptote if the N is greater than the one. Not going to happen. It's going to act like a polynomial function of degree n minus m. Okay? So, give me the other case. What if n is equal to m? 2. Then it's the ratio of the coefficients. If a was 7 and b was 4, then it would be 7 over 4. Your horizontal asymptote would be at y is equal to 7. Okay, so that gives you that. Now, they go through all this. When n is less than m, then that ratio is going to be the, the y is equal to 0. Because if n is less than m, if you have x in you, do that ratio, you have x is left over the denominator, and those go great, very large, your ratio goes to 0. So y is equal to 0, and the x axis is large all the time x is equal to, n is equal to m, same thing, then the ratio goes to 0, I mean, this goes to 1, so now you have the ratio of a sub n to b sub m, okay? Just the ratio of the leading coefficients. That's your horizontal asymptote. y is equal to that value. And when n is greater than m, then that acts like a polynomial, okay? Because you, you have x's up here and no x's down there. As x gets large, it's going to large, positive, or negative, depending on the sign. Okay. So no horizontal asymptote if your numerator has greater degree than your denominator. All right. Any questions on asymptotes? We already sort of went over those. Okay. Let's do so. Find all the vertical and the horizontal asymptotes and graph this first part. f of x is equal to... Um, 2x squared over x squared minus 1. Where do you want to start? Don't have a what? I, I can't do it, huh? Okay, why do we not have a horizontal asymptote? Where do we look for a horizontal asymptote? Horizontal asymptote is, think, end behavior. And where did you look for end behavior? Leading terms. If you have two leading terms, you look at ratio of the leading terms. What's the ratio of 2x squared over x squared? So your horizontal asymptote is? Is what? Okay, what's equal to 2? Y is equal to 2. Remember, horizontal asymptote is always Y. Vertical is always X equal. Okay. So Y equal 2. So you got a good start right there. Horizontal asymptote. Let me draw the graph here. Ooh, ugly graphs. Okay. Y is equal to 2. 1, 2. There's your horizontal asymptote. Now, sometimes I do those in red. I won't do those in red. Now. Okay, we got a start. What next?
Vertical asymptotes. What's going to determine your vertical asymptote? I heard, I saw the mouth move, but I couldn't hear anything. Okay. Speak up. Okay. Now, the denominator where it cannot be zero. That's going to be your vertical asymptote. So we're focusing on the denominator now. So guess what we want to do to that denominator? Fine. You told me before. Factor it. How does that factor? Say again. Minus one times x plus 1. Okay, what does that tell you? x cannot equal negative 1 and x cannot equal positive 1. There's negative 1, there's positive 1. Since this is indeed a vertical asymptote, I'm going to make that red. Vertical asymptote, x can equal negative 1 and x can equal positive 1. There we go. Okay? Could have done horizontal asymptote that too, but you could touch that. You can't touch either one of these. Okay, what you want to try next? They just said do the asymptotes. I say let's do the other easy stuff. Okay, intercept. Which intercept do you want to do first? Okay, what's going to be true about the y intercept? X equals zero. So can you plug in zero for x? What would that give you? Zero, zero. You got it. So there is both your x and your y intercept is, or at least one. Let's see. I don't want to get back to here. Zero, zero. Okay. That's the only y intercept you have. Do you have any other x intercept? X intercept would be where? Say again. It's where y is equal to 0, except y is equal to 0, that's the numerator is equal to 0. Only place that 0 is x equal to 0. All right. So that is our only intercept. Okay. So we have no clue. So we know it's going through here, but we have nothing else to tell us where it's going anywhere else. Okay? So we're going to have to do some test points. Take me some test points. You tell me, what would be some good test points? We already know what's happening in one, it's vertical asymptote. One half. So we'll do a test point at positive one half, how about one at negative one half? Another one. How about out here? Negative two. How about over here? Positive two. You need to get one you see, what your vertical asymptote and your zeros do for you is break the function into uh, portions of the domain. We don't know what's happening here. We don't know what's happening on this side of that zero or that side of the zero. And we don't know what's happening there. So we don't have four test points here. You want to start with a one half? Sure. X equal one half. Let's plug it in. What's one half squared? One fourth. Two times one fourth is one half. Over one fourth minus one. Negative three fourths. So we had one half over negative three fourths. So the two and the four will go away, and that gives me negative two thirds. Right? So negative two thirds at one half, you're at negative two thirds somewhere right down about here. Okay? Want to do negative one half? What will that give you? Negative one half squared is one fourth. So that's still going to be one half. Negative one half here is still going to give you one fourth. So it's going to, so it's going to be the same value. That's symmetric about this even function. So, so sure enough it's here. I know where this one's going. From here, it's going downhill, and from here, it's going down. Has to be approaching those vertical asymptotes. I didn't draw it very nicely. It should be rounded, smooth at zero. 
So there you got it. Kind of looks like a parabola, but it's not. Okay? What's well, another test point? Second two, x equal two. What happens if you plug in x equal two? So that'll be eight up here. Eight over three. Eight over three is two and two thirds, right? Okay, two and two thirds. Here's two, there's three, so it's going to be something short of that, right about there. Okay? And guess what? If you put a negative two in, it's symmetric about the y-axis, so it's going to be the same thing over here. So I know where this one's going. It's going to approach the vertical asymptote this way and the horizontal asymptote this way. Vertical asymptote this way, horizontal asymptote that way. There we have it. I didn't have to plot anymore. We don't call that. We got the idea, right? So over here it's in the upper quadrant. Down there it's between the two lines going south. Over here it's in the upper quadrant again. Not quite a quadrant. You got it all covered. All your domain is covered except plus one and minus one. See how it looks? Not that hard to do. All you really have to do is your two asymptotes, vertical and horizontal, your two uh, intercepts, uh, x and y, and then maybe a few test points, whatever is required <coughs> to determine that. All right, I think we're through with that. Any questions before I erase it? All right. Uh, so let's erase all that ink. Okay, let's do the B part. Where do you want to start? Y intercept. Okay, and what's that going to be? He goes for the easy stuff, doesn't he? One third. One third, positive one third. Y intercept is at one third, so let's do... Those are my ones. So one third is going to be right there. Y intercept is zero, one third. Okay, we got a point. What's your point? Never mind. Okay. I didn't do very well on that one. That's kind of too far away. Okay. All right. Next, we pick the low hanging fruit. Tell me. X intercept. Is that what you meant? No, what did you mean? X intercept. What's going to be true there? Y is equal to zero. F of X equals zero. What's going to make F of X equal zero? The numerator. And so where is that? How do you know that? Okay, one foot. Okay, so x equal 1 is certainly enough going to be an x-intercept. So we got another point, okay? 1, 0. Is that the only one? What, what, what might you want to do to that numerator? Factor it. And we already know one factor, don't we? x minus 1. What does the other factor have to be? x plus 2. Let's see if that works before we go with it. x times x is x squared. That works. Plus 2x minus x plus x minus 2. Yes! So what's your other x-intercept? Negative 2. So here's your next one. So we're making good progress here. we got three points already. What else might we need? Horizontal asymptotes. How do we get that? Ratio of the leading terms. What's the ratio of the leading terms? One. So what's equal to one? Say again. Uh, one's equal to one. Yes, we got that. Yes, one's equal to one. Yeah, it is y. F of x. It is y. Y is equal to one. So there's your horizontal asymptote. Everybody see that? Horizontal asymptote y equal one. Good deal because the pressure of leading terms. Okay, what's the one thing we don't know yet? Vertical asymptotes. How do we get that? 
Yes, and you know the denominator can't be equal to zero. So what might we do before we investigate it? Factor it. That's a safe answer, okay? How would that factor if it factors? X times X. And what do you say? Negative 3 and plus 2. Let's see if that works. X times X, X squared. Plus 2x minus 3x minus x up minus 6. Yes. So what are your values? Okay. X cannot equal 3. There's 3 there. I'm going to make this red. You don't have to, but I just choose to. That's a vertical asymptote there. Okay. And the other? Negative 2. Whoa. Aha. You know what? What should we have done at the very beginning? We should have factored everything inside. And then what do you notice? Common factors. Right? Those should have been gotten rid of. Right? Okay. So, um, let me see. I want to go back to black. That's why I was trying to remember what I was doing. Okay. Yes, we factor out the common factors. Boo hiss. What we do know now is x cannot equal negative 2. We thought it was going to be a uh, 0. It's not because it's in the denominator. It cannot equal negative 2. Okay? So we've got one vertical asymptote. we got a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so, and we have these two points, so that one's no longer a point. These two, you know, it's got to be going down this way and up this way. So, that pretty much defines this for you. Except that, right here, you got a hole in the graph, right? Because x cannot equal negative 2. It can't because that makes your denominator 0. So, there's where you have the hole in the graph. That's what it is. function there. My drawing really stinks. Something like that. Okay. What are we going to have to do now? And how do we do it? What do y'all like taking? What are we going to take next week? Or a week after next? A test, yeah, a test point. Okay, we love tests. Okay, we're going to do a test point. And where do you want it? X equal 4? Okay, so let's plug in X equal 4. Alpha 4 is equal to what? 16 plus 4 minus 2 over 16 minus 4 minus 6. So this is minus 10, so that's going to be 6 in the denominator, that's going to be 20 minus 2 is 18. 18 divided by 6 is? 32. Say that again. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Why didn't I do that? So yeah, what do we get? Uh, 3 over one, so it's three. Still got the same answer. The y is equal to three there. So we know where we are up here. We're going up the vertical asymptote there, down the horizontal asymptote there. What kind of shape is that? Hyperbola. Exactly, that's the hyperbola. Pretty ugly one over here, but that's the hyperbola. See how it works? I'm sorry, yeah, we could have done the easier one to look at. You got the same answer. See how it works? Y intercept, I mean vertical asymptote where your denominator can't be zero. Horizontal asymptote, end behavior, ratio of leading terms. Your x intercept, where y is equal to zero, where that numerator is equal to zero. Your uh wait, y intercept is where x equals zero. You're only gonna have one of those if you have one. That's uh just plug in x equals zero, whatever your ratio of the constant terms are. And then 
your x-intercept is well, y is equal to zero, and that for your numerator is equal to zero. And this we thought we had to, we should have factored everything in sight first. Lesson to be learned. Okay. Uh, that was example two. Oh my, we've run out of time. How could it happen? Okay. Now what they did not show, oh, they didn't show the second graph. Shame on them. They should have shown it with the hole in the graph. Okay. But anyway, we got it. Okay. Let's see. Sorry. Let me just get rid of this and say, This is all the things we've already done. That first one. There it is. Okay. They went through how to get there. We were out of town, so we couldn't. On the B part, they should have factored first and gotten rid of the common factor and then gone from there. X can equal negative 2. Okay. All right, so we finish example two. The next thing we're going to do is sketching the graph of rational function, which we just did. Homework exercises. This means, folks, the, we have class on Thursday, regular, and it sounds like our test is going to be the Tuesday when we get back. Gives you lots of time to study for your test, right? Okay, homework exercises here. Do either five or seven. Seven's in calcview.com. Any of the odds, 9 through 15, 15's in calcview.com. And we'll stop there, and we'll do the sketching after next time. Okay. Folks, I'll say this again on Thursday. Take advantage of the Thanksgiving break to maybe get your papers done, because it's getting close to the end of the term, and I still don't have a bunch of them. Like most of them, but several of you have turned them in. No, not that many. But so, uh, what's that again? Is it, it's going to be after we get back from Thanksgiving. Next week is Thanksgiving. I'm not going to pass out any stuff. Yeah. You are. Okay. Uh, would you rather take it then or, the, or wait until after Thanksgiving? When you come back. When I come back after Thanksgiving, I'm going to be out another week. You are? Yeah. It's the last two weeks of the term? Before final? Yeah. Okay. No, not the two weeks. I'm just going to be out the one week after Thanksgiving. Right. Okay. But you don't want to wait until the next week to yeah. take it. You'd rather take it ahead. Okay. Okay. I'll try to have it ready. Okay. Yeah, the whole week of Thanksgiving is off. We we are here, but the uh, no classes. There's, there's professional meetings going on. So some instructors are going to be there, some are going to be elsewhere, so they just mm -hmm. let all the students go that we say. This Thursday, they laugh, and then after. And then after the thank you. Yeah. Right. You'll have something to be thankful for, right? Yeah. Ah. All right. Good deal. Take care. You too. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Colby didn't make it in. Oh, let me end this.